Good afternoon. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are picking up this afternoon um, where we left off, looking at um, the proposal to create an agency of public safety um, from various different angles um, and with, with various entities who, uh, who would be impacted by this potential change. And so what we're gonna do, I think to start out with is invite Mike O'Neill, who is the uh, president of the Vermont Troopers Association to share with us um, your perspective on what the creation of an agency of public safety would mean for your members. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, again, for the record, my name is Mike O'Neill. I'm now the executive director of the Vermont Troopers Association. I retired a couple of years ago and now I'm working for the union. So le left state employment and went to work for a union um, and really enjoyed this job. And it, there's, there's a lot of significant opportunities to testify this year. I'm sure that I may see your committee on again <laughs> as the year goes on. Um, the Troopers Association represents the troopers and sergeants in the state police. Um, the Lieutenant Steve Howard's organization, VSEA, still represents. Um, and we represent them on all collective bargaining issues, discipline, uh, everything that any other union would handle. On this issue, I don't see at face value that immediately there is a major impact to our membership. It looks like most of the changes here are a matter of who's being brought into an agency of public safety and how those changes would go. So as far as how troopers and sergeants are impacted by this, I think it would be a matter of how some of the details of this are worked out if this were to happen. What I do see just from my own perspective is not just bringing some other law enforcement in, but creating what appears just to be more bureaucracy between the management of each of these law enforcement divisions and the secretary. It looks like it's gonna create at least two more commissioner positions and a deputy secretary position. Um, I'm sure there's some reasoning behind that and some thinking coming from the administration on this proposal, but in creating a department of law enforcement, from what I see, what it does is put the colonel of the Vermont State Police, who is the one that manages and supervises all public safety issues in Vermont, and many on a very significant scale, another layer, it creates another layer between he and the governor's office when they need to have that communication. Yeah, you know, if I were creating this, I think I would have four divisions, we have a Department of Law Enforcement and a Department of State Police, because the issues of the Vermont State Police are so much more, so much different than those of DMV or Fish and Game or Liquor Control, if they're eventually brought in. You know, those are departments that have enforcement related responsibilities that are very narrowly related to their function um, in their department. So I don't know if there's much more I can add to that right now. If you have questions I can answer, but you know, I, I think we're gonna have to watch and see what happens with this and figure out what may impact our members and what position to take on that. All right, thank you. Committee, any questions for Mike from his initial comments? John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and Mike, thank you for testifying um, today. Um, do you have any concerns about the changes being made to, to putting the Vermont Criminal Justice Council underneath the, the, what will be the agency of public safety? Um, I've had some conversation about that and put some thought into it. And initially, I think we're still preparing to learn what the changes made last year will do for the council and how the council will function with the addition of several new positions. I think there's 24 members on there now. <laughs> and I don't know that your intent was to have you know, a role of a secretary overseeing the council or if you wanted the council to remain independent. And it's not a question I'm prepared to answer as far as our position on it. I think we, have to really figure out how a lot of this will work. I think there is some benefit to the training academy itself 
falling under an agency and another level of supervision above that. But that's much different than the council and how the council will function. So I don't know that I have an answer yet, if that, if that answers your question. No, no, thank you. That was a good answer. <clears throat> One of the rationales that we have heard in committee um, uh, about the benefit of creating this agency and bringing different law enforcement entities together under one umbrella is the opportunity to share um, equipment. And I guess, um, I guess I just wanted to understand from your perspective of someone who's been on the ground and, uh, and had to use you know, your state police equipment, how realistic is it that, uh, that, that these various law enforcement agencies um, would be sharing boats and snowmobiles and trailers and, 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 and thereby finding some uh, economies of scale by being able to trade equipment back and forth? From the perspective of my time as a trooper, what I would say is the, the equipment is very specific to the department using it. it. It's all marked very specifically to either state police, fish and game, DMV, and there are people that are assigned to maintain and use that. At times when there may be the necessity to help each other with that type of equipment, Normally, the officer involved is going and helping. And, and I think over the years, we've always seen that. Fish and Game is very willing to come over and help the state police on issues that we have in common. So we work together frequently anyway, and I don't see that this would change that. So I'm not sure that sharing of equipment really will, at least from what I've seen, be an issue. I, I, don't, I can't think of any specific examples that it would really change the way things are working now. Bob Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Hey, Mike. Yeah, uh, this morning we had DMV in and I asked uh, uh, a little bit of a question about duplication of tasks on like the DMV truck inspection folks and the state police. Um, if they both came into the same, under the same umbrella, you think that, uh, has there been any conversation about the duplication that might lead to the troopers unit being disbanded, all the responsibility sent over to DMV and the troopers being sent off on road patrol or other higher uh, priority sort of tasks. There is, there is sort of a duplication, right? Uh, in some ways, in the past, the state police had a truck enforcement team and that goes back, I think many years now. So I guess I've been around for a while. Um, Today, DMV does just about all of the truck enforcement. That is their role. They are the ones that handle truck enforcement. They help the state police at times with accidents involving uh, commercial vehicles. But the role of DMV is primarily truck enforcement and the state police is all other enforcement. So I don't know that we will run into that issue. I think it depends are there changes made where they're trying to pull one into the other um, would there be a push to take, you know, truck enforcement people from DMV into the state police and make them troopers? I think that's a lot of the questions that are unknown. And I, I don't see a benefit to that. I've always said that taking positions from another department to bring them into the, say, the state police doesn't really give us more positions. It gives us more responsibility. And those same bodies are still going to be handling the same enforcement. So I don't know that I see that there's going to be any change either on that level. John Gannon. Thank you. Uh, Mike, are, are there any positions opening in the Vermont State Police right now? There are always positions open. I think as of today, we're somewhere in the ballpark of 30 vacancies or more. And it always depends on the training cycles of the academy. Yeah, how many can we get into each class to try to maintain a level of staffing where we're not holding a high level of vacancies? So please don't quote me on the number. I think it's around 30 as of now, but I haven't asked that question in a couple of months of exactly where we are. Okay, and has that typically been the case that there's that many vacancies? 
Uh, it goes up and down depending on many factors. Um, re retirements are always a big issue. How, how many are coming at any given time? Um, how many people do we lose to other agencies, other jobs? We've seen a bit of a spike recently in troopers looking at other employment. And it's something I think is occurring around the country in law enforcement. Much of it is in part to what's going on with society regarding law enforcement. And a lot of people are really asking them a question, is this a profession I want to stay in with what's taking place nationally with some of the changes in attention on law enforcement? Would you be at all concerned that if you know there's a large number of vacancies in the state police that there would be an effort to at least on a temporary basis um, you know, reassign DMV officers um, to fill those positions? We would always be concerned about that. As a union, our position would always be that the work of our members, the troopers and sergeants, be conducted just by our members. And I'm sure DMV would have the same concerns from their perspective. Um, you know, I, I think as a state that has collective bargaining and is supportive of unions, we should always uh, stick with that principle. Thing. And do you know if there are differences between the collective bargaining agreements between the, the troopers and DMV law enforcement officers? Yes, there are. Um, I think there's a lot of significant differences. Compensation and benefits are different in each of them. And, you know, some may argue ours are better. I might always argue they're different. And it <laughs> depends on the job you're doing and what benefits go along with the responsibility of your job. But yes, there are differences. Can you explain any of those? Uh, the state police pay scale is different than the pay scale of VSEA, um, which includes the state law enforcement. They're all in the non-management bargaining unit. We have a pay scale that is, everybody in state government has a pay scale with 15 steps. Our pay scale is one step each year until you reach the 15th step. The rest of state government has a pay scale that is five one-year steps, seven two-year steps, and I believe three three-year steps. So it is a significant difference in the amount of time it takes to get to the top of that pay scale. The pay rates in them are also different. Ours actually is a little bit lower than the VSEA pay scale, but you accelerate through it faster. So there are some differences that are a little complicated to understand without really sitting down and going through some of them. Thank you. So Mike, thank you for being with us today. Um, I guess I wanna bring you back to thinking a little bit about the um, Criminal Justice Council um, and shifting away from training and looking more at the professional regulation of law enforcement. Um, you know, you, you touched on this briefly a moment ago about the, uh, the intense focus of the public on law enforcement right now and the, uh, and the challenges that that can bring uh, to, to folks who are, are serving as law enforcement officers. Um, it has been the focus of ours um, for a while to improve the, uh, the oversight and professional regulation of law enforcement. And what we recognize is that, um, you know, we need to have a, a, a robust uh, criminal justice council uh, in order to do that professional regulation right now. And, uh, and they are reporting to us that they need to have certain resources available to them. Um, I guess setting aside for a moment the conversation about how this executive order might impact the Criminal Justice Council's ability to advocate for what they need to, to do that job, um, how are your members feeling about, uh, about professional regulation in general and about the process that uh, that, that they undergo if somebody alleges that they have acted improperly as a law enforcement officer? Um, as an organization, we actually were one of the first involved in the process of creating Act 56. I worked closely with the director of the academy at the time, Rick Gauthier, who was the former director. Um, and both of the government operations committees, both your committee 
and in the Senate, uh, we supported changes that brought professionalism to Vermont law enforcement. We feel that our members have always been held to a very high standard. And there aren't many situations where I believe the council would be acting on certification to remove somebody's certification. And that person was still employed by the Vermont State Police. So our members support this because they know that if you're in a situation where the council were to be taking your certification, you probably or, or most definitely would have already lost your employment with the Vermont State Police anyway. So as a bargaining unit, I think it was an easy thing for us to accept because we know the discipline within the Vermont State Police is probably in most cases much, uh, a much higher level than the council would be holding people to for certification. Thank you. Any other questions from committee members? All right, I hope you'll stick around for a few minutes in case sure. we uh, come back to you and have any other questions for you. Okay, thank you. Um, so Steve Howard, um, you can, I would invite you to share your thoughts on the executive order proposal uh, generally and, um, and get specific in whatever areas you'd like to. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if it's all right with you and with the committee, since I suspect uh, between now and May, you're going to hear from me an awful lot and probably get sick of my voice. <laughs> I'm going to defer to somebody who actually knows something about this matter. Um, John Federico is, is here with us. John is a member of the VSEA, a leader in the VSEA, and a career uh, law enforcement officer. So if that's all right with you, I, I, I think I will defer to him for our testimony on this issue. Thank you, Steve. John, welcome to the committee. Um, very nice uh, background you have there. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, you inviting us to speak to the committee today. Um, for the record, my name is John Federico. I am a commercial vehicle enforcement inspector for the Agency of Transportation, Department of Motor Vehicles, Division of Enforcement and Safety Commercial Vehicle Enforcement Unit. It's a mouthful, I know. Uh, I have six years, uh, going on seven years of experience with the DMV and have served in law enforcement in Vermont since 1990. Uh, I'm also the VSEA, uh, new VSEA representative on the VCJC and the LEAB. Uh, I am here today uh, testifying on my own time and representing my views and those of the vast majority of my colleagues. To that end, uh, nothing I say today is intended to assert or imply that the administration has anything other than the best interests for Vermonters in mind, and we are not questioning their motives. I am a member of the VSEA, and I understand that the breadth of the executive order may affect many VSEA members, but I cannot today speak for all of them. The DMV Enforcement and Safety Division's mission includes protecting Vermonters by enforcing highway safety regulations meant to protect Vermonters' lives, protecting Vermonters highway, Vermont's highway infrastructure and protecting the integrity of DMV systems for titling, licensing, registration, and more. We are the resource for DMV staff and for law enforcement statewide as the subject matter experts in what we do. How do we continue helping them and maintaining that expertise one step removed from the DMV? Perhaps now the institutional memory will serve us, but will it in five, 10 or 15 years? We would agree that modernizing policing and endeavoring to form the best public safety delivery system for Vermonters are indeed laudable goals. We believe we can have a fair and equitable, efficient and responsive system of policing at the state level without creating a large cumbersome police agency with multiple priorities, albeit under the umbrella of public safety. We would oppose the governor's executive order and we ask the House representatives to object if the legislature feels the idea warrants further consideration, we would ask that it include the rank and file in any legislative study committee. This fall, we asked the VSEA to serve, survey all of uh, sworn law enforcement officers in the state of Vermont, not including the troopers represented by the VTA. The bulk of sworn officers are made up of DMV inspectors and investigators, fish and game wardens, and liquor control investigators. 87% of the officers surveyed or against a move to be absorbed into an agency of public safety. We oppose this order because of our concerns about mission creep and our concern that critical highway safety mission may be diluted by the larger demands of an agency of public safety. 
We oppose this order because of the importance of maintaining the priority of our mission and how it ties to federal highway funding. We believe disconnecting AOT from the federal uh, requirement it required enforcement provisions will create difficulties and not efficiencies, not at least without a purposeful, transparent and vetted process for how they will be accomplished before such a reorganization occurs. We believe in the demand for fair and impartial policing and accountability for police officers. We believe that a smaller unit supervised as it is today lends itself to greater accountability and support for police officers than the structure of a super law enforcement agency. We oppose this executive order because of the lack of information and real discussion about how this will impact our mission and our work and the absence of a detailed plan for execution. We believe that a 90 day rush to consider an issue this large is too short and too compact a timeline for us and for you given all we have on our plates in this pandemic and in these challenging times. There are too many unknowns that deserve a full and thorough discussion. Financial impacts are unclear. The impacts of a singular control and philosophy of one law enforcement agency are unclear. And the impacts of the Enforcement and Safety Division civilian educational unit, investigators and support staff is also unclear. We oppose this order because DMV and DPS law enforcement officers already can and do work together. We already are all state of Vermont employees. DPS and DMV officers have things that we already do or can easily do together today. We're one phone call or radio call away from asking one another for assistance at any level. We're already quite capable of and amenable to sharing information. DPS is currently set to adopt the same records management system and, and dispatching system that we currently use, which will increase that capacity. We can offer one another joint training opportunities. We coordinate and cooperate in special operations and when needed and with the right person to give assent, we can share resources and all of this without a drastic change in the organizational chart. At, as DPS, we too are required to abide by all the same policies that the legislature has and may deem essential for all Vermont law enforcement officers to follow and to accomplish any similar mandatory training. We're concerned that the executive order is a solution in search of a problem, at least as far as the incorporation of the enforcement and safety division is concerned. To be sure, the current way of doing things is neither the only way nor necessarily the best way. At the end of the day, this isn't about us, it's about Vermonters. However, we believe it is a way that works well for Vermonters. It is in fact unique, like Vermont is unique. And that's always been a good thing. Thank you. Thank you, John. I appreciate you uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, any questions from committee members? John Gannon. Thank you. And John, thank you for testifying um, this afternoon. Thank you. Um, you know, Commissioner Sherling said he reached out to, to talk to a lot of people um, in putting this executive order together. Did he reach out to um, DMV um, law enforcement officers um, and discuss the, the order with them, to your knowledge? No, not to my knowledge. Thank you. Rob LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Sorry, I'm having some internet stability issues here, so hopefully this will help. Um, good afternoon, John. Um, a question I have is, can you tell me, I, I understand a concern about becoming part of a, a larger super agency. Where, what's the benefit of remaining part of DMV as we currently know it for what you folks do? Sure. Thank you for that question. Uh, I think that, you know, we understand it's that our mission is, is most is more closely aligned with uh, the, the Department of Motor Vehicles than it is than it is anywhere else. And so while we talk about potential streamlining and efficiencies uh, on one side of, of the coin, on the other, you're, you're sort of taking away those efficiencies uh, and, and streamline uh, opportunities uh, when you remove us from the network of the DMV. Um, and, you know, the bulk of our, our work and, and, and just, uh, I can't even imagine the amount of legislation 
uh, that's out there that interconnects our mission with all the the Title 23 motor vehicle laws and, and the things that the Commissioner of Motor Vehicles is responsible for. I mean, it's a great question for your legislative council, exactly uh, how is it that, that things can continue to operate smoothly if you simply change the title of Commissioner of Motor Vehicles to Secretary of, um, of Agency of Public Safety? Does it, does it work that way? Um, you know, we're, we're very concerned that uh, how that will all work if, if, if they separate us from DMV, um, but yet um, the bulk of our work responsibilities and, and missions continues to sort of be at the core of DMV. Okay. Very good, thank you, John. Mike McCarthy. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, John, thanks for testifying today. I served a couple terms on house transportation before coming over here to GovOps. So I'm new here and, and might know more than some of the other members about how integral the work that you do is to, um, you know, not only preserving the highway safety, but also, um, you know, making sure that the folks who are paying the their taxes, you know, through the apportioned uh, system that we have for commercial vehicles are complying with all of the IFTRA and, and the various laws there. And one of the concerns that came up for me when I was considering this proposal and bringing DMV in under this larger agency is that, you know, we, we fund and kind of keep the transportation funds separate uh, in, in large part um, by, you know, uh, having, you know, DMV transportation being over there. And then there's only a little bit of a transfer of money from the transportation fund that goes into um, funding the state police for their portion of the highway safety stuff. So I'm wondering from your end, you know, do you see any sort of mixing of the transportation and um, getting away from having the, the dedicated enforcement to making sure that we're you know, collecting the, the, and that there's compliance with the various um, apportioned um, fuel tax and, and other uh, apportioned payments that commercial vehicles use if we bring DMV in under the agency. Thanks, sir. The, the, they're all very good questions. And, and um, I think they fall under the, the challenge of the unknown. Uh, without a roadmap, um, I, I don't think you, we can answer those questions. Um, um, we know that they work where we are today. Um, and I was, uh, I was really struck um, by, the, by the, what I felt was a, was a pretty good endorsement of, of what we do by um, listening to the gentleman's comments today from industry. Um, to hear that from the, the actual people that you, know, you, you regulate, you go out and you, you stop them and, you, and sometimes you give them tickets and you put them out of service. And, you know, and, but, but to have uh, that and still shake hands and smile and, and, and at the end of the day, uh, I think speaks volumes for where we are. Um, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sort of the new guy. At, I, I still consider myself the new guy at, uh, at DMV. Um, and since coming here, um, uh, I think uh, a lot of what we do is to, is to, is to make sure that we're keeping uh, industry all on the same playing field so that, so that everything is fair. Everybody's, everybody's doing uh, things the right way and, uh, and Vermont's infrastructure is, is protected. And, and, uh, and I, I think it works well today. We're well supported um, both in the funding arena uh, and, and other arenas. Um, and I, I just don't know how that will, will change. Um, and, you know, I, on top of the comments uh, that, I, that I've heard, you know, I would say um, we, we, we could maybe be assured of that today but as administrations change, you know, I just don't know what assurances down the road uh, any of us uh, can be given about those things. Thanks. Any other questions from committee members? While I'm waiting to see if anybody dives in to raise their hand, um, you mentioned that you are the BSEA representative to the Criminal Justice Council. Yes, it's a brand new uh, position that we were afforded. Um, and so I've just uh, participated in one or two meetings uh, thus far. 
Mm -hmm. And what's your sense of how well the newly constituted council is coming together and getting up to speed to, to take on its tasks? Uh, well, I've already gotten my first subcommittee assignment. I'm very excited about it. Um, in my um, previous to DMV um, uh, career, uh, I did a lot of recruiting um, for my former agency. And, uh, and so I'm gonna be working on um, updates to entrance testing uh, requirements, both the written test and the physical fitness test and that, those kinds of things um, to bring them up to today's standards. And um, really looking forward to that. And I, you know, I think uh, um, the, the fact that we've expanded the committee may mean that uh, it, 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 it has the chance for a lot more work to, to be done. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, I, and, and if I can put a plug in, uh, since, since you asked, uh, the, uh, I talked about it earlier, the, the funds that the uh, Academy is requiring, you know, we, we, would, uh, we would support that. You know, I, I see the very uh, benefit and the need uh, for, the, for the things that they outlined and uh, I think they're important. Thank you. Um, did you also mention that you are on the Law Enforcement Advisory Board? Yes, that's correct. And how long have you been on the board? Uh, uh, just just recently. Again, they, those those uh, the position that the BSEA was afforded just started in January. Okay. And uh, have has the board met? Yes, I've had um, two meetings uh, with that board and uh, I'm on a subcommittee uh, of that working on uh, the body worn camera policy. Perfect. Uh, we're going to come uh, back to this issue tomorrow afternoon um, just to hear uh, a, a little bit more about the progress that's being made um, with the newly constituted board. But if you have any uh sort of maybe higher level um, thoughts that you can share with the committee. We've got a couple folks here who are brand new to the legislature and a few more who are new to the committee um, here in government operations. So what is the Law Enforcement Advisory Board focusing on in addition to um, the body cam policy and uh, and what do you think would be helpful for brand new legislators to know about the, the work of the board? Oh, I wish I could speak a little bit more intelligently about that, um, but uh, really given that uh, um, that I've only that I've only participated in two meetings and they have largely surrounded the issue uh, of the body uh, warrant cam policy that that uh, I think I think we're trying to make sure it gets done uh, because I believe the 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 ask is that um, the LAB uh, the LEAB handed off to the the larger council um, for their consideration. Um, so really, the push has been to get that done. And so my, I'm straining already my memory to to see what else uh, what, what was next on the on the uh, block uh, for them to consider. Um, uh, but uh, that's that's what the focus is on really at the moment. Yeah. Well, I've totally put you on the spot there. Um, <laughs> couldn't pass up the opportunity to get your perspective on. I know we have other priorities. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions from committee members on uh, DMV law enforcement perspective on the executive order? All right, I see none. So thank you so much uh, for being with us, John and Mike uh, and Steve. Thank you for, for being with us as well. And um, you know where to find us if you have any other thoughts that you uh, wanna share with us after, after you leave the meeting. And we look forward to talking with you again. Thank you, much appreciated. All right, committee, here we go. We have Amarin with us to do a walkthrough of, um, of our boards and commissions bill. And um, I don't know if John or Rob wanna just sort of give us an orientation to what 
is in this bill, um, where it came from, why are we considering it? And then we can let Amarin take us through the actual language of the bill. Sure, I can provide a, a brief overview. So two bienniums ago, um, this committee um, passed legislation to create the Sunset Advisory Commission, um, which is a commission um, made up of um, both House and Senate, two House and Senate members each, and um, two, two members appointed by the governor. So there's a total of six people on it. And our responsibility is to review um, all the boards and commissions um, in the state um, with the purpose of identifying one, should some of them be terminated because they're no longer serving a useful purpose? Um, two, should some of the, them have their statutory language be modified because their, their role has changed or should be changed? Um, and also to look at making per diems consistent. Um, so currently the, the standard per diem that uh, a volunteer to a board gets is $50 a day. Um, but when we started this process, um, it, it, they, were, they were all over the map. Some were $30 a day, some were more. Um, so we want to be sure that we were being fair um, with how we were treating board members um, with respect to their funding. Um, so this, we've been meeting in the off session in the summer. So this was the third summer we met. We have one more summer to go before this whole process is over. Um, we've been working our way through all 250 plus boards. Um, one of the challenges is every year the legislature meets it, it approves a new board, um, some of which we take a look at. Um, but so that's what we've been doing. And, and the good news is that we've been able to repeal um, many boards because either they're not serving a useful purpose um, or haven't met in a long, long time. Unfortunately, boards um, just sort of hang out there, even if they're not meeting um, or not serving a useful purpose. And this way, you know, we sort of eliminate um, some of those boards and commissions. Um, one of our final tasks is, is to try to come up with a process to organize all the boards and commissions so that the governor's office, who has the major responsibility for appointing members of the boards, but, you know, anybody who's looking to serve the state um, has a database that they can go to um, to identify all the boards and commissions. Um, there was a former um, state employee, Otto Trout, who some of you may have heard of, um, who voluntarily kept the list of all the boards and commissions in the state. There was no official list of all the boards and commissions. So that's been part of our, our responsibility too. And so, you know, we are still working with the Secretary of State's office um, with respect to that, um, especially Vasara, um, about trying to compile a database that will have all the boards and commissions so that we can keep track of them. Um, so the bill in front of you basically identifies um, boards and commissions that we think need to be repealed um, or some of their language to be modified. Um, this year, we were a little more, um, what's the word I want to use? Flexible in some cases in, in not making a formal recommendation in the bill with respect to, to a board or commission, but in some instances, sending memos to chairs of various policy committees to consider um, making changes um, um, to some of these boards. And I will highlight one board that we will discuss that's in the bill, which is the, the Commission on Women. Um, you know, as Sarah knows, um, Jeanette, Senator White and I sent her a memo asking us to specifically look um, at the lobbying language that is currently in the language around the Commission on Women and whether that should stay there. And, and the reason I'm highlighting that is it is the only border commission that is prohibited from lobbying. Um, and that may be a unique um, because of how the Commission on Women was created. It was originally under the governor um, by executive order. Um, and then um, it went into statute. Um, so that's something that you know, it's, you know, obviously the chair decides whether we take that up or not, um, but that's one thing that we asked um, that this committee um, discuss. So if anybody has any questions about the process, I'd be happy to answer them now or offline. 
Um, I think it, it has been a productive um, commission in eliminating a lot of boards and commissions that really serve no useful purpose. Rob, do you want to add anything? No, John, you did an excellent job of reading everything I wrote down for you. <laughs> no, excellent job, my friend. Uh, you guys are great. Thank you for your great work on this. And John, thank you for setting the context uh, for what we're about to look at. Um, and uh, now, Amron, I think we will go to you. And I believe you have provided the bill to us on our committee page. It should be there, yes. All right, we will look at it on our secondary devices and would love to follow along with you. All right, for the record, this is Amarin Abergele, Legislative Council. I'm going to do a walkthrough of H120. 122. This is a bill that proposes to amend statutes relating to the state's boards and commissions. As a preview within this bill, we have uh, the National Forest Lands Board, the Commission on Women, the Toxics Technical Advisory Board, the Champion Land Transaction Citizen Advisory Council, and the Working Group on Conservation Easements. Beginning towards the bottom of page one, and I should note, I've been having some connectivity issues today. So if I disappear, I will try and log back on <laughs> and go okay. from there, but I just wanted to warn you. Um, okay, so section one, starting with the repeal of the National Forest Lands Board. This repeals an entire section here. This is a section that uh, states that the consent of the state of Vermont um, is given to the acquisition by the United States by purchase, gift, or condemnation with adequate compensation of such lands in Vermont with approval of a board um, consisting of the governor, lieutenant governor, attorney general, commissioner of forests, parks and recreations, and secretary of agriculture, food and markets. And this section repeals that board entirely. It leaves other um, sections within this chapter 13, um, jurisdiction of the United States um, alone. So all of those still stand in terms of the other operations of um, land transfer between the state and the United States government. Now I'm scrolling down to page three in section two. Uh, these are some conforming changes to specify that the lands that we're talking about are national forts within the state of Vermont. So that is section two and section three. Moving down to section four, this is a, a section which adds chapter 70 to title three. Um, as Representative Gannon was mentioning, this uh, Commission on Women was originally established by executive order and it was placed within title three under chapter one, the governor's chapter. Uh, this. Uh, proposal would move the Commission on Women into a new Chapter 70 within Title III. And I'm scrolling down to page four. Uh, there are some changes in here to the to the appointment process um, and perhaps composition of the commission. The commission would still consist of 16 members. Um, however, it eliminates in sec subsection one here, it would lift the restriction that not more than four of whom shall be from one political party for the governor's appointments. And then for the eight members that are appointed by the General Assembly, uh, it keeps the uh, structure that four would be appointed by the Senate Committee on Committees and four by the Speaker of House. However, down here in subdivision B, uh, it does essentially increase uh, the number of legislators that may be appointed from two to four um, in that each chamber may appoint not more than two legislators. And if a chamber appoints two legislators, they shall not be from the same political party. And then it specifies in subdivision C1 that not more than four legislators may serve on the commission at one time. <clears throat> Moving on to page five. This has kept all of the same language that the commission had previously. Moving into page six, again, all of the same statutory language will be kept. 
And the same is true of page seven. And now page eight, uh, section six is going to be some conforming revisions to make sure that there are, um, if there are re references to the Commission on Women, um, that they be redesignated with section 5025. Um, and uh, that the Office of Legislative Council needs to revise any of the statutes that have an outdated cross reference. Sex, section seven is a repeal of the Toxics Technical Advisory Board, <clears throat> which occurs down starting on page nine, subsection E. And this uh, would repeal the board in its entirety. You'll see all of the uh, duties of the board are outlined on page nine, moving into page 10. and into page 11. And I'm going to skip down to page 12, section eight. This is a repeal of Champion Land Transaction Citizen Advisory Council. This would uh, repeal the statute, uh, eliminating the council in its entirety the council uh, duties were to function as a forum to hear and attempt to resolve concerns involving the so-called champion lands that are brought to the attention of the council regarding ongoing use and management of state lands, collaboration with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and public access to uh, the public and privately held lands. I'm now on page 13 for those of you that are following along. And the council, uh, also functions as a source of information to persons interested in learning about the transaction, including its legal conditions or about the ongoing use and management of the land. So moving from page 13 into 14, uh, this um, is more elimination of the statutory provisions regarding this board. <clears throat> Beginning on page 15, section nine repeals the working group on conservation easements that was established by uh, the uh, act number 118 from 2012 in section nine. And in section 10, <clears throat> this is the repeal and transfer of duties of the pre-kindergarten uh, dash 16 council, is that pre-kindergarten to 16? Uh, so a couple things to note about this, the, the duties are being moved from this pre-kindergarten to 16 council, um, which is currently residing in chapter 99, uh, which is the general policy chapter in the education title to the Vermont Higher Education Endowment Trust Fund, which is in chapter 90. Um, and chapter 90 is funding of post-secondary education. The pre-kindergarten to 16 council was created to help coordinate and better align the efforts of the pre-kindergarten through 12 educational system with the higher education community. The, uh, you'll see that there is the composition of the council uh, is included here, which has 17 members. The council develops and regularly updates a statewide plan to increase aspirations for and the successful completion of post-secondary education among students of all ages and otherwise advance the purpose for which the council is created. I'm now moving on to page 18. You'll see more uh, striking of language for this council. Moving into page 19, at the top of page 19, I will note that this council currently does have duties in connection with the Higher Education Endowment Trust Fund, which we'll see uh, further down in this bill. So section 11 is the amendment to uh, chapter, is it 90 or 99? Um, to the Vermont Higher Education Funding chapter. And within section 11, I'm going to scroll down onto page 20. There are some conforming changes here to note that uh, 
the council is now being created under subsection H of this section rather than within uh, subsection 2905 of the previous chapter. The same is true for those edits in subsection E. Moving on to page 21, this bill would create a new subsection H which is creating the Vermont Higher Education Endowment Trust Fund Council to perform the duties set forth in subsections D and E of this section. The council will be attached to the office of the treasurer for administration purposes and shall be composed of the following members. And you'll see those members listed here, one through seven. A couple of things to note while there is um, a repeal of the pre-kindergarten to 16 council and transfer of some of the duties that you see in subsection D and E. Um, as you'll notice, there was a lot of language that was stricken from the, the pre-K to 16 council that is not being moved over here. So just pointing out some of the differences when, we, when I mentioned earlier that the, the council was going to have a statewide plan, um, about uh, furthering its work, those sections are not transferred over here. Um, in terms of the composition of the new council, it has seven members listed here rather than the 17 that were listed in the, in the prior version of this. Um, I will, although I will say that these seven members are part of the 17 that are currently listed for the existing council. And in terms of um, some other minor language changes that the committee might want to look at here. Um, the, we have, for example, number one lists the president of the U University of Vermont. Um, in the current council, it's specified or designee for all of these, um, for all of the appointed members. I would recommend either saying personally or by designee for each of these so that it's clear whether you actually are requiring the president of the University of Vermont personally or whether a designee is sufficient for purposes of the council. And then also I did note that in the, the pre-K to 16 council, when we're talking about a member of the house and of the Senate, there was a sort of term restriction on how long they served in the council in the current pre-K to 16 council, which is that the member of the House or Senate would serve until the beginning of the biennium immediately after the one in which the member is appointed. So just while it is labeled a repeal and transfer, I just want to point out it is not a transfer of everything from the pre-K to uh, 16 council over into this new council. There are some differences. And then lastly, the effective date is that this shall take effect upon passage. Thank you, Amron. Um, right. Any committee members have questions sparked by a jog through the bill? Mark Higley. Thank you. Uh, if we could go back up to page four, line nine and 10 on the uh, Commission on Women, it talks about it's striking out no more than four of whom shall be from one political party. Um, I guess. I guess, why would that be stricken? That, that to me allows it, allows the governor to choose eight members that could be from the same party, am I correct? John, do you or um, Rob have, have thoughts on why it is, drafted you know I have to go back and look at my notes on that um, I know there was a, a good reason why we we made those changes um, but I'll check my notes okay thanks because that that seems a little concerning to me that's not usually the way things are set up but uh, just I, I would like to know why I guess thank you Madam Chair, could I venture a guess that might jog Representative Gannon's memory? Yes. Just looking at this, and this is the first I've ever seen of it, so I might be totally wrong, but it sounds like those eight appointees aren't legislative. They don't necessarily, they aren't necessarily elected officials. And in Vermont, since we don't register our party affiliation, how would you know what party they affiliate with? 
I, I think, Mike, you were correct. But I will double check my notes. I think that was part of the consternation with respect to that. Right. I suppose the governor would then have to ask in order for him or her to know whether an appointee was of a particular political persuasion. Um, any other thoughts, questions from committee members? John. Um, thank you. So if we go to, to, I just wanna highlight the lobbying language so that people can take a look at that. Um, that is on page seven, starting at line six. Um, so this is still in statute, but um, we did receive a memo um, from the Sunset Advisory Commission um, as to whether or not um, this language should be struck um, from statute. As I noted earlier, um, the Commission uh, for Women is the only um, commission or board that has this type of language in it. And, you know, we had Carrie Brown testify before the Sunset Advisory Commission. She's the executive director of the Commission on Women. Um, and not, not only is the lobbying language in, in, these, in, in this thing concerning, but it also impacts contracts that they may have with other people because it applies to anyone they contract with. Um, and it can be difficult. Like if you're contracting with a law firm, um, they may, you know, not as part of their uh, agreement with you, but they may be lobbying for other purposes. Um, so she did testify about the concerns about that language, but it's also, um, you know, why is this the only border commission um, that has a restriction on its ability um, to lobby? As most people know, um, Many organizations, um, boards and commissions come into our committee rooms um, to serve as subject matter experts and testify. Um, but, you know, this to some extent, um, you know, brings into question whether the Commission for Women can do that. And I mean, they've put some valuable um, information together about the impact of COVID-19 on women and unemployment. Um, so I, I just raise this as, as you know, hopefully a starting point for a discussion about what to do with this language. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, Mark Higley. What's the difference between lobbying and testifying on a particular matter? Does, does lobbying get into uh, you know, getting behind a uh, individual campaign and allowing them to contribute is that is that part of the lobbying? I think lobbying goes to advocating for a specific position. Um, typically, um, being paid to advocate for a specific position. So, it, so it doesn't go as far as you know, um, be, being allowed to uh, lobby for a particular candidate um, in, in an election? I, I wanna double check to VSA chapter 11. Thank you. Right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Amron, for, uh, for giving us a, a walkthrough on this bill. Um, we will need to spend some time uh, as a committee getting a little more familiar with the Toxics Technical Advisory Board and what it did and uh, why it's no longer necessary. Uh, we'll get a little blast from the past on champion lands and even further uh, in the past, um, I guess, as we look at section one on acquisition of federal lands. Um, so uh, if the committee doesn't have any other questions, oh, Hal's got a question, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, John, you mentioned um, earlier uh, that there, there is a, a database in the works 
um, and, and very much need it. Whose responsibility will, will that be? And in any sense of when that might be coming online? Um, that is a project for um, our final um, summer um, before the Sunset Advisory Commission sunsets. Um, okay. But, but the Secretary of State's office and more specifically the SARA would be responsible. We've been taking testimony from Tanya Marshall um, with respect to how to create it. She has some ideas um, with respect to how to do it because other states have tackled this process because we do want to have um, a transparent way for Vermonters to see what opportunities there are to serve in government. Um, right now, it's not always transparent um, what positions are available and who appoints them. Now, typically the governor appoints the majority of members to boards and commissions, um, but in some instances, the speaker um, and the Senate committee on committees um, also appoints people um, to a variety of boards and commissions. Um, so one good thing about doing this was all this data would be collected in one place. The governor does have some uh, sort of database on this, um, but it's not totally accurate as we found in trying to hunt down some of these less active boards and commissions. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Amarin, for, uh, for taking us through the boards and commissions bill. And um, thank you for the context, John, and of course, Rob, for all of your contributions to preparing those remarks. We will come back to this in many, uh, many different ways, I'm sure, to take a look at each of the boards or commissions that is contemplated. And um, so I believe that is all we have on our agenda for today. Yeah. All right. Um, any other questions, committee, before we sign off? All right, see you all a bright and early tomorrow morning back with Amarin on the OPR bill.